Here we have two different functions, function one and function two, that serve the exact same purpose. They implement the exact same algorithm, accept the exact same input, and will always return the exact same results. What might be easy to miss here are the execution times for each function. On my machine, function one took just over two milliseconds to execute, while function two took only 66 microseconds. That's actually over 30 times faster than function one. In any type of production environment, you definitely don't want to leave an efficiency improvement like that on the table. Before we take a look inside the functions, let's just take a look at our input. RETS is just a time series of floating point numbers. In this case, they represent stock market returns, but the data could represent anything. What the functions are doing is calculating the compound return of the time series. This is just an example chosen to showcase the principles though, so don't focus too much on that. Now, this is how the slower function looks behind the scenes. Let me go ahead and explain the algorithm, bearing in mind that this is the exact algorithm used for both functions, it's just going to be the implementation of the algorithm that differs between them. First, we're going to add 1 to each of the elements n number of times. Then we're going to take the natural logarithm of each element, also n number of times. Then we're going to sum across all of the n elements. At this point, the summation returns a single real number, which we then exponentiate, and then subtract 1 from. This is what the function returns as the final answer. This is a big O of n algorithm, as the number of operations grows linearly with the size of n. Specifically, the addition of 1, the logarithm, and the summation will all run n times, while the exponentiation and subtraction of 1 will run a single time in this case, since the input only had a single time series in it, as determined by its shape. Let's get back to the code here. As I mentioned, this is the implementation for the slower function. How can we start to speed this up? The important thing here is that no matter what, this sequence of operations will always be big O of n. You'll always be burdened with loops, and you can't actually reduce the time complexity in this case. What you can do, though, is change the speed at which those loops are ran. The punchline here all comes down to vectorization. Vectors are just a way of storing data of the same type contiguously in memory. While not being the only advantage, employing vectors can lead to tremendous performance advantages. One of the reasons why vectors are so fast is because they tend to be implemented in lower level languages, such as C and Fortran, which are much faster than using native Python. This is one of the reasons why Python is commonly referred to as a glue language or a wrapper language. You can basically just use Python to invoke methods written in other languages. The other main performance advantage is parallelization. Vectors can in some, but not all cases, perform operations in parallel, as opposed to what we're doing in this function, which is sequentially. The reasons behind the performance improvements doesn't stop here, though. With all that out of the way, let's start turning this native Python function into a fully vectorized function. NumPy is the vectorization library we're going to be using for this. The first thing we're going to swap out is the exponentiation function, which as we now know is a big O of one operation, so we shouldn't expect to actually see any sort of improvement gain. The next thing we're going to swap out is the logarithm list comprehension. The computation of the logarithms can now be done in parallel, which I'll get deeper into shortly. We also no longer need an explicit Python for loop, as the loop is now implied within the NumPy function. As we can see, we now have a very substantial performance improvement, as our execution time is now a third of what it was before. The next thing we're going to swap out is going to be the summation. Once again, we're going from a pure Python to a vectorized summation to take advantage of parallel computation as well as the speed of C. The last thing we can do now, believe it or not, is we can actually move the Python addition and subtraction operators inside the logarithm and exponentiation NumPy functions. NumPy created functions specifically to accommodate this, as this is actually something that's done quite frequently. Now, NumPy was actually used even with the regular operators, as they were overloaded, however this implementation bundles them together and increases efficiency. This is now peak efficiency and completes our fully vectorized function. After timing it, our final result is now down to the 66 microseconds that we saw before, which is a full 30 times faster than the original function. Something else worth bringing up in addition to the performance advantage of vectorization is the design advantage. As I mentioned at the start, vectors are a way of contiguously storing like data types in memory. What I didn't mention though is how vectors are actually implemented at a high level in code regardless of the library being used. All vectors have a certain dimensionality associated with them, which refers to the number of components that make up the vector. So far, I've only been using a single dimensional vector, where the elements represent returns of a single stock. Well, what if you had a two-dimensional vector, which expressed stock returns across multiple stocks, and you wanted to compound the returns for each one in isolation? It turns out that our original Python function would not work, while the vectorized function would. This is because we want to perform an element-wise operation that spans multiple dimensions.
Since we need to run all of the operations in this function for each stock, we would in fact need an unavoidable nested loop in order to achieve this, regardless of how we design the function. In this specific example, it is unlikely that we would go above three dimensions, but in other areas such as deep learning, where vectors are called tensors, it's common for these tensors to reach up to three dimensions, such as in the case of an image where you would have length by width by a quantity of color channels. In certain cases, such as within recurrent neural networks, tensors can even reach upwards of five dimensions. It might be starting to become clear now why you'd want the design of your code to be indifferent to its input dimensions. This brings us back to the explicit Python for loop that we converted into an implicit vectorized loop. In this case, we can hand it a two-dimensional input, and the logarithm function will now run two different nested loops rather than a single loop without any changes to our function. We can now run it with a two-dimensional input and get output for each stock separately, as intended, with better designed, efficient, and modular code. Now what role do these implicit loops play under the hood? The fact that the loop is implemented in a compiled language is not the only reason why it is faster. This brings us back to the concept of parallel computation. The goal is to have each of our elements have the same operations applied to them at the same instance in time, but this can't be achieved by multi-threading alone. It turns out what's going on here is a little deeper. This brings us to SIMD. SIMD, or Single Instruction Multiple Data, is the computer architecture design that allows us to perform parallel computation. In a SIMD architecture, during the CPU's fetch execute cycle, a single instruction is fetched and is executed simultaneously on multiple data elements. This is made possible by packing our vector elements into a special type of register called a vector register. Each register will be operated on at the same time within a single fetch execute cycle. If there are more elements within the vector that can fit into a single vector register, which is often the case, multiple registers will be used. The degree of parallelism in the number of vector registers that can be executed simultaneously depends on the specific SIMD architecture, pipelining, and the hardware implementation. If you have multiple vector registers, they could be executed on different CPU cores at the same time, or they could be done one after another in chunks. The data within a single register will be done in parallel regardless, though. When we were doing this with a Python for loop, each iteration would be performed sequentially, requiring the overhead of a fetch execute cycle for each individual element. This is why you don't tend to see many loops in numerical or scientific applications. Not all operations can be performed in parallel, though. SIMD operations are most effective when the same operation can be applied to multiple data elements in parallel without dependencies between them. If there are data dependencies, such as one calculation requiring the result of another, explicit loops may still be appropriate. Hopefully you now have a little more understanding behind why the usage of vectors are so widespread in certain applications and can get a little more use out of them yourself. Thanks for watching.